Hello everyone. I've been sitting on this video for quite some time and I was trying to see whether I could make it shorter or snappier or more TikTok-like and then in the end decided that actually no that's not gonna work and so you're going to get um, another video of the kind that you already know from my channel. And today's video is about a question that I, as a teacher of ancient languages, am asked quite often. And that question is, what is the oldest language in the world? Uh, often I'm asked this question not in this exact form, but rather in the form of, is X the oldest language of the world? And so I would like to try and maybe answer it, maybe go towards answering this question. But I think in order to answer it, we first of all need to ask ourselves, what does this actually mean? What is the age of a language? And I would argue that in order to answer this question, we need to take a few steps back and look at the bigger picture, which as far as I'm concerned is Communication. Living beings, all living beings, communicate. Plants communicate through chemical or electric signals. Animals communicate in a large variety of ways. For example, through seismic signals. Um, so elephants will stomp their feet and um, that can be felt kilometers away by other elephants. Animals communicate through color changes, through smell, through facial expressions and body language. So for example, on the left, you can see my cat the day that I adopted him from the shelter in what I assume is a please don't kill me expression. Whereas on the right, you see what by now is his much more customary facial expression, which I interpret as meaning you are going to feed me. Are you not human? And of course, animals communicate through sound. Cats meow, dogs bark, cows moo, and so on. But no animal species, other than humans, has language. What do I mean when I say that? What is communication as opposed to language? What is the difference between the two? Isn't it obvious? For example, if you take this sentence, which is the opening sentence of the US American Declaration of Independence, and compare it to what my cat said to me earlier, meow, then you'd say, well, you know, it's perfectly clear that the two are completely different. But animal communication can be quite intricate, and human language can be quite simple. When my cat said meow to me earlier, I said no, for example. And so the question how to distinguish, to, to distinguish language from other forms of communication has been studied and discussed by linguists, by language researchers in great detail. And the answer that we would give to the question of what differentiates language from other forms of communication nowadays, in a nutshell, is the following. Language has abstraction and recursion. Other forms of animal communication do not. What do I mean by abstraction and recursion? For example, there are various apes that have been taught how to um, communicate with humans. And such an ape might be able to, for example, signal something like me eat banana. But it probably wouldn't be able to signal something like me eat banana you brought earlier. The banana you brought earlier, that would be a form of abstraction, and more specifically, it would be a form of recursion. Recursion is the linguistic term for the ability of languages to um, take an element in a sentence and expand on it to give further information on it. Which banana? Oh, the banana that you brought earlier. An example of this, another example of recursion in English would, for example, be the vase that the maid that the agency hired dropped broke. Some would argue that this is a correct English sentence. Others would say, yeah, but I would never say that. Still, let's take a look at it. The vase broke is our main statement here. 
Well, which vase? Which vase are you talking about? Oh, the vase that the maid dropped broke. Which maid? Do we have a maid? Yeah, you know, the vase that the maid, that the agency hired dropped broke. So here we have three levels in a sentence um, with the vase broke being the main statement on which we then expand by giving further information on first the vase and then on the maid. Um, and these, this ability to give further information is what we call recursion. No non-human animal communication that, re that uses recursion has ever been observed. Depending on who you ask, all human languages, or perhaps all human languages except one, have recursion. If we accept this difference between the various many forms of communication that we find in the natural world, um, so between these many forms of communication on the one hand and language on the other, and we can say that language is limited to humans. If we look around, we can also see that all humans have language and they have language naturally. I may need to teach a child how to write, for example, and I will have to probably teach this methodically, systematically, perhaps in a formal environment such as a school. But any human child that is surrounded by, sorry, I have to say, every healthy human child that is surrounded by humans speaking a language or languages will learn this language or these languages um, um, with perfect ability, with the ability of a native speaker. So all humans have language, all humans acquire language naturally. Humans, that is Homo sapiens, first appeared around 300,000-ish years ago. Language probably first appeared at around that time, you know, give or take a couple of millennia. We don't know if this development of language happened once and then spread as humans migrated, or whether language came to be in several places independently. Still, there we are, the oldest language, hooray. Problem is we don't have any evidence for this oldest language. We don't know what it would have sounded like, what words it would have used, what its grammar would have been. So um, what the rules were for creating words, what the rules were for putting words together in a sentence to create meaning, we don't know any of that. The only possible evidence that we have of language from the past is writing. Yes, maybe in the last hundred, 50 years or so, we also have audio recordings, and that, of course, makes a big difference. But apart from this very, very small period in um, human history, the only possible evidence we have of past language comes in the form of writing. And so let's take a look at the earliest attestations, the earliest evidence of various languages. Around 5,000 years ago, we get the first Egyptian hieroglyphics. More than around 4,500 years ago, we get the first evidence of Sumerian from modern day Iraq. From that same area, we also get variants of other languages, Canaanite, Akkadian, Eblite, Elamite, Hurrian. Around 3,800 years ago, we have the first evidence of Hittite, which is the oldest attested Indo-European language. So a language from the family that also includes English, Italian, Lithuanian, Hindi, and so on. Then at some point we get the oldest forms of Greek, Chinese, Hebrew, Latin, or Persian, Tamil, Sanskrit. And if you're interested in where I'm getting these numbers from, please go to Wikipedia and take a look at the entry called the List of Languages by First Written Accounts. It's a veritable treasure trove that also is regularly updated. Um, so if we find new inscriptions, for example, or if there is new research suggesting a different dating for an inscription that already existed, it is put into that article, into that entry, I think fairly quickly. All of these that I just mentioned, all of these earliest attestations are inscriptions on durable materials, stone, clay, bone, sometimes metal. And the dating of such inscriptions is greatly debated, and you usually have to give or take, you know, at least a century or two. 
But still, there we go, our oldest languages, Egyptian, Sumerian, yay. Well, how meaningful is such a statement? Written attestation is the only actual evidence we have for language from the past. But it's not as though there was silence before the first writing that happened to survive. And what happens to survive often does so by chance and is often dependent on entirely non-linguistic factors, such as climate. If you live and speak your language in a dry or arid climate, then it may very well be possible that um, papyrus scraps, scraps of writing on every day on ephemeral materials, such as papyrus, um, that were chucked in the bin and that landed up in your municipal garbage dump, survive for several millennia. Whereas if you live in a, an area where, which, for example, has an annual wet season, then you may have to expend a lot of care, time, attention, perhaps some form of money on keeping um, texts that are written on everyday or sort of reasonably everyday materials, such as bulk or certain kinds of leaves, um, to keep those um, existing and legible for more than, say, a few centuries. Political power, political influence can also play a very big role. Say, for example, you have a regional language, a local language, one that you speak with everyone around you, but you and your village are part of some uh, larger entity, perhaps of an empire or a kingdom of some kind, and you have messengers who come from the king, from the emperor, um, and who require for example, records as to how much tribute your village has given to the ruler in a given time period. So you say, so and so many olives, so and so many sheep, and so on and so on. And this is then recorded in writing in the language that is chosen by the king for super regional communication. The language that the king uses, or the emperor, or whatever, is of the exact same age, you know, it exists at the exact same time as the language that you speak with the people in your village. But the language that you use to communicate with those around you, you don't need to write down because, you know, if you want to say something to someone, you just go over and tell them. And so a language that happens to be used super regionally will, much, will, will be much likelier to be written down first than a language that exists at the same time that is only used for regional communication, for local communication. So climate, politics are both non-linguistic factors that however play a great role in determining whether a language is put down in writing or not, and whether the written documents survive or not. So the only sure evidence that we have of a language, i.e. written language, does not allow us to say what the oldest language is. The only thing that we can say is when a language is first attested in writing. And that is worth a lot, I would argue, but still it doesn't tell us what the oldest language is. Sometimes we can actually even say more. So for example, the oldest Sanskrit text, or I should say the oldest Vedic text, which is in a nutshell, a precursor of Sanskrit, um, the so-called Rig Veda, which is a collection of hymns, um, and especially books two through nine of that, which are the oldest uh, parts of the Rig Veda, are presumed to be between 3,500 and 3,000 years old, even though the oldest material attestation of the Rig Veda is only around 1,000 years old. So how do we arrive at this 3,500 to 3,000 years old figure? Well, we know that the Rig Veda existed as part of an oral tradition for many, many centuries before it was first written down. So it was passed on from teacher to student. The teacher would say a bit of text, the student would repeat it again and again until the student also knew the text. We can establish a relative chronology between the Rig Veda and other texts that we have from South Asia. So, for example, there is a history of ideas, the ideas, thoughts that we find first mentioned 
in, for example, the Rig Veda that we then later see expanded on, fleshed out, systematized. And often the texts in which these ideas have become, you know, much more developed also show um, uh, signs of being linguistically more innovative. So the language of these is newer, is younger than the language of the Rig Veda. And in that way, we can establish a relative chronology between different texts, between different types, genres of texts. And we can use that to then, um, we can use this relative chronology for more or less educated guesses at how much time would have gone past between one genre of text, one stage in the development of ideas to the next. And when we do that, one estimate that we come up for the age of the Rig Veda would be between 3,500 and 3,000 years. So yes, sometimes we can go beyond written attestation, but still it's not as though there would have been silence before this oldest surviving text. Those who came up, who composed the very first hymn of the Rig Veda, did not suddenly start speaking in order to, com to compose this hymn. They were speaking quite merrily on a regular basis, one would assume, also before then. And so we come to the idea of the oldest spoken language. This is something that you find discussed online quite a bit. So for example, if you Google it, um, which I did, uh, you get lots and lots of hits. And if you look at the, the ones that I showed you here, you know, you find suggestions of Tamil, Hebrew, Egyptian, Sanskrit, um, the bottom link again, Tamil. But the thing is that this question, what is the oldest spoken language? This question lacks any linguistic basis. That is from a linguistic point of view, from a language research point of view, it is meaningless. This is a fairly strong statement. What do I mean by that? The main factor that we need to consider when we think about the question of what the oldest spoken language is, is language change. We know that language changes over time. We know this from personal experience. Your grandparents maybe used words or use words that you don't use anymore. If you're a little older, your children or grandchildren maybe use words that you didn't use uh, when you were younger, that didn't exist when you were younger, but that have developed as part of language that you're speaking changing. We also have audio evidence of this, as I say, sort of past 150 years or so. So if you see um, speeches from the 1950s, the 1960s, you will hear that the language used back then was different in many ways from the language that you maybe use nowadays. To give you a more systematic example, um, I'm giving you in a sentence in English, and I'm just choosing English because, you know, that's the language I'm speaking right now, so I assume that's the one language we all have in common. A sentence in English, um, as reflected in various New Testament translations, and I'm giving you this one line, one sentence from the New Testament, not in order to somehow favor um, uh, the New Testament or the Bible or Christianity, but simply because when it comes to the history of English, the New Testament just is a wonderful text that, useful text that has been translated into English again and again, and thus allows us to see what one and the same sentence would have looked like in English across the, the centuries. And the sentence that I want to use is the following. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. That's the way in which this sentence appears in modern English or specifically in the New International Version, which is a translation of the Bible. Now, if you go 400 years back and look at the King James Version, you get the same sentence as, and they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. So I don't know whether I'm pronouncing this correctly. I'm not a scholar of the history of English, but I can see that I kind of understand the sentence. I can see spelling conventions have changed. I can see that there are words in there such as abiding that maybe I wouldn't use in everyday speech anymore, but that I still understand. Now, if I then go back another 200 years and arrive at Middle English, I'm not going to even try and read this out. I'm not going to try and um, subject you to my attempts at pronouncing Middle English, let alone Old English. 
But when you look at the Middle English translation, you see that, you know, there's, for example, letters in there that we don't use anymore. If you look at this sentence on its own, which is English, perhaps you wouldn't understand what it's saying. Perhaps you would understand what it's saying if you look at the modern English version of this sentence at the top of the screen. But when we then take back a step even further to Old English, I would argue that even if you did know that this sentence at the bottom and the sentence at the, to at the top are the same sentence, you would not necessarily be able to understand each word and know exactly what each word in that Old English sentence is doing. Even though this is still English. And so we can here see that over time, one language changes into another. What do I mean by that? This is both English, modern English and old English. What, what, you know, why am I saying one language changes into another? When it comes to distinguishing languages, we have this idea of mutual intelligibility. You would say that you and I are speaking different versions of the same language, for example, different regional accents, if we can still understand one another. I can understand what you say and you can understand what I say. However, um, if um, I cannot understand you and you cannot understand me, then this would be the linguistic situation in which we would argue that we speak different languages. All languages that we can observe change all the time. But each generation can communicate with the generation above and the generation below, perhaps also two generations above, two generations below. And so there is a continuation of mutually intelligible forms of speech from me to my grandparents, from my grandparents to their grandparents, to their grandparents, to their grandparents, and so on, arguably, all the way back to the first humans who had language. And thus, any spoken language, in a way, is of the same age, is not older or younger than another language. So how do we get different languages? Well, let's imagine one speech community, one group of people that live together, that all speak the same language, that all understand one another. And then, for example, through migration, through conflict, through war, through natural catastrophe, or whatever reason, this speech community splits in two. In each community, the language is going to go on changing, because that's what spoken language does. And at some point, the changes in one language and the changes in the other, sorry, this changes in one mode of communication and the changes in the other mode of communication will have made these two modes of communication so different from one another that the speakers of one cannot understand the speakers of another anymore. And that's when we then say that we have two different languages. And these two languages each continue the original one language and they're each of the same age. Some languages change more over time. So, for example, English uh, changed greatly after the Norman conquest of 1066. Celtic languages changed a lot because the speakers of Celtic migrated a lot throughout the history of their um, of the past centuries and millennia, whereas other change languages change less. For example, the speakers of Lithuanian mostly remained in one area and mostly did not have a lot of contact, were not conquered, for example, by speakers of different languages for a very long time. And so Lithuanian has changed much less over the centuries than, for example, English or um, Irish has in the same time, in the same time space. But still, continuous change from one generation to the next is continuous change. And so again, even if a language has changed more than another language, you cannot say that one language, one spoken language is older than this other language. Then the question of naming comes in that also may confuse matters a little. Ancient Greek developed into modern Greek. Latin developed into the Romance languages, Italian, French, Romanian, and so on. Furthermore, ancient Greek is first attested several centuries before Latin. Is modern Greek thus older than 
Italian? Well, no. You know, that Italian isn't named modern Latin simply because Latin has lots of continuance, lots of languages where no one of them is modern Latin. They all have individual names. With Greek, it's basically one form of communication, more or less, and that is then called modern Greek. But this question of naming does not influence the question of um, whether one language is younger or older than another. So as we've seen, neither naming nor first attestation tell us about the linguistic age of a language. So therefore, from a linguistic point of view, I am arguing that the concept of oldest spoken language also is meaningless. But why then do we find claims that language X is the oldest language so very frequently? This sounds like a linguistic statement, but the statement language X is the oldest language often is actually culture-based or faith-based. For example, within Judaism, we have the statement that originally the whole world used the same language, the same words. This is a sentence that we find fairly early on in, in Genesis, which is the, the English name for the first book of the, um, of the Torah, which was compiled as a continuous work around 2,500 years ago. So this text is at least that old, probably older. But then what comes next in Genesis is the story of the Tower of Babel, which describes that humans have become so arrogant that they tried to build a tower to reach heaven and to basically reach the realm of, of God. Um, and that therefore, as a punishment, um, their linguistic unity was destroyed and they were given lots of different languages um, and so couldn't communicate with one another anymore. However, Many names that you find in the, in, the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, only make sense when you understand them as actual Hebrew words. Um, these are sort of speaking names, and you often say, you often get a name then explained, why was this person named this? Why was this place named this? And when you see these not as random names, but as Hebrew words, you can understand their meaning. And therefore, we have the inference that Hebrew must be that original language that was spoken before the Tower of Babel. In Hinduism, you get, for example, in the Shatapata Brahmana, which is around 2,700 years old, you get the description of how the world was sung into existence by the deity Prajapati. Um, and he sang the world into existence by means of the words Bhuch, Bhubach, Swah, which means earth and ether and the heavens. And so these parts of the world were sung into existence through Sanskrit words. And so the idea is that if the world is brought into existence by use of these Sanskrit words, Sanskrit therefore must be the oldest language because it predates the existence of the world as a whole. In Buddhism, you also sometimes find uh, the description of, of Pali, which is the language of some parts of Buddhist scriptures, as the, the root language, the oldest language. And if you belong to a faith community, then, and if you believe in the, the literal truth of the scriptures of this faith community, then you have your answer to the question, what is the oldest language? But often, this goes beyond faith, beyond religion. Language is a part of our identity. Language is a part of our culture. So when I say all the, our language is the oldest language, then I'm often using language as a proxy for, for culture, for being, for daily reality, for existence. If my speech community is in a cultural conflict with our neighbors, whoever, who speak a different language. And our neighbors are trying to evict us from, you know, get us from away from the land that, that we have been living on. Then the idea that our language is the oldest language kind of stands in for our culture is the oldest culture. And therefore it predates your culture, dear aggressor, 
and therefore we have the right uh, we have the right of place we have a right of existence that kind of supersedes yours we have the right to exist in this place the same argument may be used not by the um, culture that is being um, attacked but by the culture that is doing the attacking. The attackers may say the exact same thing. Our language is the oldest, and therefore we are, our, sorry, our language is the oldest, therefore our culture is the oldest, um, and therefore we have a right over whatever place, whatever ground that you just happen to be living on at the moment. So these questions are questions of power, of survival. And therefore, the question of what is the oldest language is a language that is very important to many people. But it's so very important to them because, as I say, it, it stands in as a proxy, not for a linguistic discussion, but for a question about rights of existence, of culture, of belief, and so on. And that would be my take on the question of what is the oldest language? I hope I've been able to show how, from a linguistic point of view, we cannot answer this question. We can make statements that are very helpful for linguists concerning the relative dating, the relative first appearance of languages, but the question of what is the oldest, either written or spoken language, we cannot answer. However, this answer that I'm trying to give is, is partial and is not completely satisfying. And if any of you would like to contribute to this discussion in the comments underneath this video, um, I would be very grateful. Um, I will not accept flames, so um, I will only um, admit comments that are actually productive, so please stay civil. And um, depending on what reactions I get from you, I may well then make a, a newer and updated version of this video taking into account thoughts or material or corrections that you've brought to my attention. But for now, many, many thanks for watching, and I hope that you have a very good rest of your day. Take care.